Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Sex Dimorphism and Trauma-Induced Coagulopathy. My name is Kim Roke, and I'm Education Manager here at the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. I'll be providing some brief housekeeping notes before we get started. Next slide. The Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders mission is to ensure that all women and girls with blood disorders are correctly diagnosed and optimally managed at every life stage. To that end, we aim to provide education to healthcare providers on the medical consequences and unique issues for women and girls with blood disorders. Excellent. Since its inception, the Foundation has focused on realizing its mission through these objectives. We have a renowned and engaged board with deep expertise in treating women and girls with blood disorders, as you can see. And we're pleased to have Dr. Mann, who's one of our board members, here to serve as moderator today. Thank you, Dr. Mann. Next slide. To ensure the best sound quality during our program, all attendees will be muted. However, you will have the opportunity to participate in a question and answer session with Dr. Coleman, Dr. Moore, and Dr. Mann at the end of the program. You may submit your questions um, during or after the presentation portion via um, the question box in your control panel, and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And with that, um, next slide, I'd like to introduce our distinguished faculty for today's program. Dr. Julia Coleman is one of FWGBD's recent research award winners for her work on sex dimorphism in coagulopathy. Dr. Coleman is Chief General Surgery Resident at the University of Colorado, Denver. She earned her bachelor's in biology at Elon University in North Carolina, her master's in public health um, at The Ohio State University, and her medical uh, degree from the University of Toledo. She's now completing her surgical residency training in Denver and will be a critical care fellow at the University State University starting in August 2022, back to the Midwest. During her seven years in Denver, she's been active in basic science research around trauma-induced coagulopathy with a particular interest in sex dimorphisms in coagulation and how female-specific hypercoagulability is modulated by sex hormones in a way that affects clinical outcomes. So she was an NIH T32 Trauma Research Fellow with the University of Colorado Trauma Research Lab for two years, has received several national grants to the NIH, and has published over 40 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts during her residency. Dr. Ernest Jean Moore, welcome, was Chief of Trauma at the Denver General uh, Hospital for 36 years. Chief of Surgery for 28 years and was the first Bruce M. Rockwell Distinguished Chair in Trauma Surgery. He continues to serve as Vice Chairman for Research and is a Distinguished Professor of Surgery at UCD and has been the editor of the Journal of Trauma since 2011. Under Dr. Moore's leadership, the Rocky Mountain Regional uh, Trauma Center at Denver General has become internationally recognized for innovative care of the injured patient, and its trauma research laboratory has been funded by the NIH for 35 consecutive years. Ooh. Dr. Moore has served as president of nine academic societies and has won more awards than we can name here today. He has uh, more than 1,700 publications and has lectured extensively throughout the world. And lastly, but not least, certainly, Dr. Kenneth Mann is an internationally known researcher who's made key discoveries regarding coagulation, including the isolation and characterization of blood clotting uh, factor V and um, the um, thrombinase complex, and the description of the mechanisms of action of pro- and anticoagulants. He has more than four decades of experience in the field of hemostasis, holds several patents related to his research, and has published more than 450 original papers, chapters, and reviews. He's received numerous um, awards, including Ash's Henry M. Stratton Award and the E. Donald Thomas Lecture and Prize. He's currently Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry at the University of Vermont and is an FWGBD board member. And we're so thankful that he could serve as moderator today. So we're grateful to all of our faculty members today for sharing their experience and expertise with us and know that this will be a terrific presentation. So with that, let's look at the disclosures for today. Uh, our faculty have the following disclosures to report, as you can see. Okay, next slide. 
Um, our webinar is accredited for CME credits today, and the next few slides do detail our accreditation process. In support of improving patient care, this activity has been planned and implemented by CineMed and FWGBD. CMEs will uh, be provided to physicians and nurses, and a follow-up email will be sent to attendees probably tomorrow, um, explaining how to obtain one hour of CME credits uh, for the program after its conclusion. To assess knowledge gain, um, sorry, next slide. To assess knowledge gain, uh, we will be asking two sets of questions during the webinar, one set before the presentation and the one after. The data will be aggregated and your results will not impact your ability to earn CME credits. Again, you'll receive an email after the program's conclusion um, detailing uh, the, um, the process for receiving CME credits. And with that, let's jump into the first poll. Thank you, Rachel. Please tell us how many people are watching with you today. Okay, just me, me and one other, two and three others, or more than three. Okay, thank you all. This is a this is a bit of a warm up, um, so a bit of a softball. Uh, next. Let's move on to the next slide. I'm sorry, the next poll question. The following characteristics on thromboelastography are associated with females. Um, prolonged time to clot formation, increased rate of clot propagation and clot strength, hyperfibrinolysis, or lastly, longer time to reach maximal clot strength. Go ahead and take just a few seconds and, and vote. Okay, good, good, we're getting lots. Oh, perfect, thank you all. Okay. And then our uh, second and last um, pre uh, question. The mechanisms underlying female-specific hypercoagulability, which confers a survival benefit after injury, include, and these might look familiar, uh, the first, prolonged time to clot formation, Increased rate of clot propagation and clot strength, hyperfibrinolysis, or lastly, the longer time to reach maximal clot strength. So please enter your responses. Terrific. Oh, thank you all. Ooh, we've gotten um, some different responses this time. I'm looking forward to hearing the presentation to, um, to fill us in on that. So with that, um, I would like to, uh, to turn it over to Dr. Coleman for her presentation and remarks. So thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. Thank you so much, Kim. I wanna first start by thanking the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders uh, and Kim for the invitation and opportunity to speak with you all today. Of course, wanna thank my uh, longstanding mentor, Dr. Moore. None of the work I'm presenting today would be possible without his mentorship. And similarly to Dr. Mann, who's our moderator today, but I also consider a mentor and has helped me immensely in my work. So thank you to all and I appreciate the invitation. I wanna start by, by telling a story. And I'm hoping that today will be a little bit of an unconventional version of Journal Club and that there will be a little more storytelling today. And so I want to start with a case. Um, I am, as, as described, a surgery resident, chief surgery resident right now, and am going into uh, trauma surgery. And so that's uh, my perspective uh, going into this talk. And so I want to tell the story of a patient case. So there were two patients that were brought in as trauma activations to our hospital after a highway speed uh, motor vehicle collision. Uh, you can see the male patient in the top right and the female patient in the bottom right of the screen. And the male, we'll call him Mr. Doe, when he came in, he was hypotensive with a depressed blood pressure, elevated heart rate, had bilateral lower extremity deformities, had a positive seatbelt sign, facial swelling and bruising. On his evaluation by the trauma team, he had a positive FAST, which is a, a focused assessment uh, using ultrasound of the abdomen to look for fluid inside the abdomen, specifically with concern for hemoperitoneum. So had a positive FAST, had a chest X-ray that showed bilateral rib fractures and a negative pelvic X-ray. Uh, the patient had ongoing hypotension in the trauma bay despite blood transfusion. And so a Reboa was placed, which is a resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, and he was taken emergently to operating room. 
In the operating room, patient had massive hemorrhage from multiple solid organ injuries and ongoing coagulopathy. TAG in the operating room showed a prolonged clotting time, a depressed angle, depressed MA, and an elevated, slightly elevated LY30. Ultimately, the patient uh, expired on the operating room table from physiologic exhaustion and hemorrhagic shock. Now, the same patient from the same accident came in, Mrs. Doe. Similarly, she was also hypotensive and tachycardic in the ED bay. She had upper extremity deformities, a positive seatbelt sign, unstable pelvis. She also had a positive fast, and she had a pelvic x-ray that showed a pelvic fracture. Similar to Mr. Doe, she had ongoing hypotension despite blood transfusion, had a Reboa placed, was taken to the operating room, also had massive hemorrhage from multiple organ injuries and ongoing coagulopathy uh, with a similar tag with depressed uh, angle and MA, uh, more so even than the male counterpart and a prolonged clotting time. This patient, however, responded to resuscitation, uh, responded to transfusion, and she went on to survive. So we've seen these cases time and time again in trauma and in other areas, in the ICU uh, and even in our COVID patients, where time and time again, we've had patients where you have a relatively similar a burden of injury and shock, yet the females seem to fare better. So we started to ask ourselves why the survival advantage that we continue to observe in our trauma patients, what seems to be driving this? We know that females are more hypercoagulable than males at baseline, and this has been fairly well described. But how this translates in the setting of trauma, whether that female-specific hypercoagulability persists, and whether it matters in the setting of trauma and coagulopathy is unclear. There's been a fair amount of conflicting literature about clinical outcomes between male and female trauma patients, and a paucity of literature that's looked at that through the lens of coagulopathy. So we decided we'd start by looking at that. The best way to really examine coagulation and for resuscitation uh, of products is using a whole blood viscoelastic hemostatic assay called thromboelastography. And uh, as I was told, the uh, majority of the audience are hematologists, so you may more know much more about TAG than I do. But a brief review uh, is that the four measurements we get from TAG that are of interest to us are activated clotting time, which is a time to clot formation, mainly an effect of the enzymatic cascade, Angle, which is the rate of clot propagation, mainly an effect of fibrinogen and fibrin. MA, or maximum amplitude, which is the maximal clot strength, mainly an effect of platelets. And then lastly, LY30, or fibrinolysis 30 minutes after MA. So we know, based on thromboelastographic analysis, that female-specific hypercoagulability does indeed exist. And we've actually, in the Annals of Surgery, well described the specifics of female-specific hypercoagulability. Specifically, at baseline, females have a shorter time to clot formation, a greater rate of clot propagation, greater clot strength, decreased clot breakdown, greater rates of fibrinolysis shutdown at baseline, greater rates of platelet reactivity, as well as fibrinogen activity. And again, the question is, does this female-specific hypercoagulability persist after injury, and does it matter comparing males and females? So we hypothesize that female trauma patients are indeed more hypercoagulable, not only at baseline, but after injury, and that this hypercoagulability confers a difference in clinical outcomes as it relates to massive transfusion and mortality. So to answer this question, we performed a perspective uh, collection of all data from two urban level one trauma centers in Denver and San Francisco, and all trauma activation patients, which are severely injured patients with an injury severity score greater than 15, similar to the patients I described at the beginning of this presentation. Whole blood was collected uh, immediately upon arrival to the hospital, and then citrated rapid tag was performed. And the outcomes that we looked at were massive transfusion, which is greater than 10 reds in the first six hours, or death within six hours to uh, account for survivor bias, and mortality. Overall, 464 trauma patients were included, approximately half each from Denver Health and from San Francisco. 23% of those patients were female. Now, at baseline, you can see that the female patients were slightly old. The time from injury to arrival was slightly longer, but both of these uh, cohorts had pretty short time from injury to arrival. And the females had a greater rate of blunt mechanism of trauma compared to a higher rate of penetrating trauma in our male trauma patients. 
Then when we looked at physiologic markers, we found that the female patients had a slightly lower uh, median systolic blood pressure. And then when we further looked at those who presented in shock with a systolic of less than 90, there was a greater proportion of females that presented in shock. And when we looked at hemoglobin, hematocrit, and platelets, we saw differences that we know at baseline in females compared to males, which is that they have a slightly lower hemoglobin, hematocrit, and a slightly higher platelet count. Now, interestingly, we didn't see any difference in the conventional coagulation assays between our male and female trauma patients. Their INRs and their PTTs were similar. And this is important because when we looked at thromboelastography, we found significant differences. Specifically, we found that as compared to males, females had a greater angle, which is rate of clot propagation, as mentioned previously, and at a higher MA or a greater level of clot strength. We found that after injury, not only did female-specific hypercoagulability persist, as seen on the previous slide, but that males uh, were more likely to present with coagulopathy, specifically with a longer time to clot formation or prolonged ACT, a slower rate of clot propagation or decreased angle, a decreased clot strength or depressed MA, and more hyperfibrinolysis. Well, does this matter? When we looked at clinical outcomes, turns out it does. On univariate analysis, there was no difference in massive transfusion rates or death overall, but on our multivariate when accounting for confounders, we found that female sex conferred a survival benefit in the setting of trauma-induced coagulopathy, such that females seem to tolerate a dep depressed clot strength better than their male counterparts. So in summary, female trauma patients are more hypercoagulable than their male counterparts, uh, not only that we know at baseline, but now we know after injury, and that male patients are more likely to present with coagulopathy after similar injury complexes, and that female sex confers a survival benefit in the setting of coagulopathy, specifically with a depressed MA. So after these findings, we wondered what could be the mechanistic explanation for this population level observation? And when you look at the overlapping keg tracings between males and females, you can see that there's many potential players in this mechanism. Uh, that females, again, have perhaps a difference in their enzymatic cascade, that have a difference in their fibrinogen activity or their platelet biology, or even a difference in their fibrinolysis protein levels. And so there's some hypothesis based on female-specific hypercoagulability at baseline that this all may be driven by sex hormones. And there's some other discussion and interest in whether this is actually a cellular phenomena and that there's a difference in the cellular biology between males and females. So to first really investigate what could be the mechanism behind this population level observation of a survival benefit in females, we first decided to look at the role of sex hormones in the enzymatic cascade, given these differences we saw in reaction time. We hypothesize that there are sex dimorphisms and cellular and soluble mediators of coagulation, which are mediated by sex hormones and confer these different TAG profiles. So first what we did is looked at progesterone and estradiol, hypothesizing they would have a procoagulant effect, specifically looking at this first in vitro. We collected whole blood from healthy volunteers, 15 premenopausal females not on OCPs or any hormonal therapy, and 15 similarly aged males. And we collected whole blood from these healthy volunteers and can, uh, performed a battery of tags, a native tag as well as two other tags that tell us more about fibrinogen activity and platelet activity, and then performed whole blood thrombogeneration. generation. And we did this in absence and then presence of estradiol and progesterone in the physiologic equivalent levels that we would see and during peak estrus and progesterone levels in a normal menstrual cycle. And we found that in vitro, estradiol shortens reaction time or time to clot formation, increases MA, D, which is clot strength, decreases LY30 or fibrinolysis, incre increases functional fibrinogen, and increases platelet reactivity. We didn't see any effect with progesterone. That was on TAG. And when we looked at whole blood thrombogeneration, generation, we found that estradiol increased our whole blood thrombogeneration generation in females, uh, whereas it had no effect in males. Specifically, we saw a significant difference in peak thrombin, like you can see on this demonstrative graph. So in summary, in vitro, we found that estradiol indeed provokes a hypercoagulable phenotype. Wondered, okay, well, do we see the same effect in vivo? And the way we decided to look at that was hypothesizing that we would see a correlative robust hypercoagulability at the times of peak estrus during a menstrual cycle in a healthy female. So we collected uh, whole blood from uh, premenopausal non-pregnant women throughout their menstrual cycle. And we first recruited women, healthy volunteers, and had them log their menstrual cycle for three months to ensure that they had a standard 28-day cycle. 
And then immediately before enrollment, we would have a negative pregnancy test from them. And then we would uh, draw their blood at peak estradiol and lowest estradiol levels during their menstrual cycle and perform the same battery of tags that we mentioned previously. And we found that amongst our 25 healthy volunteers, indeed, as compared to low estrogen during peak estrus of the menstrual cycle, there was a significant decrease in K time, which is the interval from R, the reaction time, time to clot formation, to fibrin cross-linking, uh, providing enough clot resistance to produce 20 millimeter amplitudes. So this is essentially a metric of clot formation and early clot propagation. And we also found that at peak estrus, there was a significantly higher MA. So this all suggested that, again, not only is estradiol able to provoke a hypercoagulability in vitro, but we see this in vivo as well. So this confirmed what we had expected uh, and hypothesized about hormones and their effect on the enzymatic cascade. And so then our next interest really was directed towards looking at platelets because cellular biology is another thing that's characterized in TAG. And we know that females have a significantly increased MA or maximum amplitude, which is mainly an effect of platelets. So we got interested in the cellular biology and whether there may be intrinsic differences in the platelet biology between males versus females, irregardless of sex hormones. And we were further intrigued by this because we know the platelets are highly decorated in sex hormone receptors, specifically platelets express both estrogen and an androgen receptor. So to look at this, uh, we decided we would hypothesize that estradiol mediates a differential sex specific platelet function. And we gathered uh, platelets from healthy volunteers to look at if platelets indeed from females have increased response to stimuli and if estradiol can further provoke this response. So we collected aphoresis platelets from healthy volunteers, uh, the same ones that are donating platelets that we're using in clinical practice to transfuse. And we divided them into pre and postmenopausal females based on the age cutoff of 54, which is the average age of menopause, and similarly aged males. And then we stimulated platelets with ADP and platelet activating factor and then measured aggregation and activation. Now we decided to stimulate the platelets with platelet activating factor or ADP because these are both known to cause a robust increase in fibrinogen binding capacity. Platelet activating factor is released from endothelial cells and platelets and it stimulates a P2Y1 receptor which works through G stimulatory coupled signaling to cause an increase in intracellular calcium propagating platelet activation. ADP in contrast is released from dense granules and it stimulates both the P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptor. Um, the P2Y12 receptor works through G inhibitory coupled signaling to release tonic inhibition on cyclic AMP to again also results in platelet activation. So after we stimulated platelets with ADP or platelet activating factor, we then measure platelet aggregation by looking at extent shape change, which is an established metric for propensity for platelet aggregation. And we measured platelet activation, specifically by looking at expression of fibrinogen receptors on the cell surface using flow cytometry. We overall recruited 53 healthy volunteers, 12 pre and 13 postmenopausal females, and 15 younger and 13 older males. You can here see their median age and the age ranges. First, when we looked at platelet aggregation, we found that females, after ADP stimulation, female platelets had a significantly increased platelet aggregation, whereas there was no effect with platelet activating factor. And then when we looked at platelet activation or fibrinogen binding capacity, we found that similar to our aggregation results, after stimulation with ADP, female platelets had a robust increase in platelet aggregation and activation, whereas there was no effect in males. But then when we stimulated the platelets with platelet activating factor, we found that male platelets had a robust increase in platelet activation, whereas there was no difference with female platelets. So we identified a sex specific activation and aggregation potential based on the agonist. We then wondered whether estradiol further provoke or accentuate this phenotype. So we then performed a second experiment in which we pre-treated the platelets with physiologic concentrations of estradiol and again stimulated the platelets with ADP or platelet activating factor and measured aggregation and activation. And we found similar to our other results that again when you stimulate platelets with ADP, female platelets have a significantly increase in their aggregation. And then uh, when we looked at the uh, platelet activation, we found that, again, with ADP stimulation, there was an increase in platelet activation with females, but then with platelet activate, uh, plate, uh, 
platelet activating factor or POF activation, then the feminized male platelets activation behavior approximated that of female uh, platelets so that they looked essentially the same after treating the male platelets with estradiol. So in summary, we identified both a cellular response and a hormonal effect. In a cellular response, we found that platelets from females have increased aggregation and activation with ADP, whereas platelets from males have increased activation with platelet activating factors. So there was a sex-specific activation potential. And then there was a hormonal effect in that we found that estradiol treatment feminized the male platelets activation behavior to approximate that of females. So then we, we became interested in the receptor biology. So we found this sex-specific difference in the way that the platelets behaved. And since ADP and platelet activating factor work on different receptors, we wondered if this is all really driven by a difference in the receptor biology. And so then we got interested in looking at the downstream markers of these receptors as sort of a proof of concept. And so specifically, we first wanted to focus on cyclic AMP and calcium uh, because on further dive of the research, we found that actually the estradiol receptor that's on platelets has the same downstream signaling as the P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptors on cyclic AMP and calcium. So we first focused on cyclic AMP, and we hypothesized that there are sex dimorphisms in the receptor signaling such that platelets from females have lower levels of cyclic AMP, because it's tonic inhibition, after ADP stimulation from platelets. Uh, from males. So we again collected aphoresis platelets, we stimulated them with ADP and platelet activating factor, and then we measured cyclic AMP from cell lysates via ELISA. And interestingly, we didn't see any difference amongst our 53 healthy volunteers. So we found, okay, there's no difference in cyclic AMP, so perhaps this is all related to calcium signaling, which is a downstream effect of the P2Y1 receptor, as well as the estradiol receptor on platelets. So then we got interested in looking at calcium. Well, it turns out it's really hard to study intracellular calcium because there's rapid changes in the levels and there are no really great assays to look at intracellular calcium and platelets. So we then got interested in, is there another metric, another way that we can look at intracellular calcium? And that's when we got interested in looking at RNA sequencing and platelets, hypothesizing that there would be sex dimorphisms in the RNA sequencing of platelets from males versus females such that we would see this more robust expression in female platelets. And you may be wondering, why are we talking about RNA in platelets? They're anucleate cells, but actually platelets are very richly full of RNA. And there's a myriad of research that's characterized non-genomic effects of estradiol to suggest that potentially estradiol could change RNA translation in platelets. So we got interested in looking at this, hypothesizing that we would see indeed sex dimorphisms in the RNA profiles of platelets from males versus females. So we collected aphoresis platelets from healthy volunteers, and then we processed those for RNA uh, sequencing, which includes a, a long series of assays that include sharing the RNA, adding adapters and barcodes, filtering by size, then amplifying and sequencing those segments. And we started with 17 healthy volunteers. We've since actually added more numbers to this, but we found indeed there were significant differences in RNA sequences related to calcium signaling by sex. Specifically, we first found that best one RNA, which encodes proteins promoting intracellular calcium flux, were 1.3 fold higher in females compared to males. Further, we also found that TREML1 RNA, which encodes proteins that propagate platelet activation by enhancing calcium signaling, were 1.7 fold higher in females versus males. And we really got interested in looking at TREML1 because this is a triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells protein family, and it's directly related to calcium signaling in cells. It's expressed in megakaryocytes, it's packaged in the platelet alpha granules, it's responsible for platelet activation, fibrinogen binding, cell adhesion and migration. And we also know that TREML1 uh, protects against hemorrhage and facilitates platelet aggregation in murine models. So we got really interested in the sex dimorphisms that we found in the TREML1 levels, which merit further investigation that's currently underway. So. To summarize all of this, we know now there are sex dimorphisms that exist in both male and female 
healthy volunteers, and trauma patients. There's a female-specific hypercoagulability at baseline. This persists after severe injury, and it confers a survival benefit. And when we look into the mechanisms for this, we indeed find that sex hormones play a role. They provoke a hypercoagulability both in vitro and in vivo. And sex dimorphisms not just exist in enzymatic uh, cascade of males versus females, but also exist in the cellular biology, such that Female platelets have a, a sex-specific aggregation and activation potential, and uh, we believe this is driven mechanistically by PTY1 and PTY12 receptor biology and RNA expression related to calcium signaling, all of which we believe can be modulated by estradiol through non-genomic action. So that is the story right now that we're telling and certainly is not done where we're still on this mechanistic hunt for what exactly is driving female-specific hypercoagulability in trauma patients and how exactly this confers a survival benefit in a way that really matters clinically. And so I think, big picture, what does this all mean for me as a practitioner, if you're sitting here listening to this presentation, which is that female and male's coagulation cascade and platelets are not the same. And this may be mediated by calcium and can be modified by estradiol, but it really calls into question whether sex should be considered in donor transfusion practices, and even whether there's a role for therapeutic sex-specific selection of platelets or a role for estradiol in resuscitation of patients with trauma-induced coagulopathy. And this is not a novel concept. There are previous trials that actually looked at the role of progesterone in mitigating a robust pathologic inflammatory response in TBI patients. And so using sex hormones as therapeutic adjuncts has been explored before. And I think this is a really important data to really in anyone in any practice where you're transfusing or resuscitating patients, thinking about why does that matter? When you hang a bag of platelets, do you ever wonder, are these platelets from males versus females? And does that matter? And turns out our data suggests that it might. I would like to thank uh, the uh, PIs in the lab that I work in. First and foremost, my mentor, Dr. Moore, as well as Drs. Cohen, Silliman, and Hansen. And I'd like to thank collaborators who contributed to this data that I presented here, Dr. Jones, uh, Marguerite Keller, Sunny Mitra, and Lauren Schmidt. And I'd, of course, like to thank those that have supported our work, the NIH, TACTIC, and the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. And I would love to entertain questions at this time. I believe there may be some poll questions coming up again. Hi, this is Great, Ken thank you. I'd like to uh, thank you for the presentation. But I had a number of questions to start off with. Uh, the first one was that was the study was provoked by an examination of the two victims of the auto crash. How old was the woman? So that case uh, for patient uh, PHI reasons is is much manipulated and modulated. Um, but I would say based on our tra own trauma patients, our female trauma patients are slightly older uh, than our male trauma patients uh, by average, like five to 10 years older. Um, so that would be the case uh, in general. If you pick a random male and female that are in the similar injury complex, the females tend to be slightly older. If you look at our compiled data, uh, which is interesting because then you would say, well, then statistically, maybe more of them are postmenopausal, and uh, and this question may come up, so I may be jumping the gun, but you know, if you think about this rule of sex hormones, if this is all about sex hormones, then theoretically, premenopausal women should be the most hypercoagulable, have the most robust platelet hyperactivity, and have the best outcomes. Well, when you actually look at our clinical data and you look at our basic science data, it's more complex than that. In that. Actually, with our platelet data, the postmenopausal females had the most robust platelet hyperactivity and response to estradiol. And so there is now a debate that this may, within our lab, that this may not all be about just circulating sex hormones, but that there may be these intrinsic differences in platelets in postmenopausal females as compared to premenopausal, that after a lifetime of the bone marrow being bathed in a hormonal milieu, that it may change the megakaryocyte lineage and biology such that then the platelets of a postmenopausal female are actually more hyperactive because of a prolonged lifetime exposure to sex hormones. That was a very long-winded response to your question, but I think that all ties together. So uh, another question had to do with 
thrombosis in these patients, as you know, um, if you save them in the trauma suite, the next problem is thrombosis. Are these women more sensitive to thrombotic complications following recovery? That's a great question. So as we know, really the early, and this is work that's been very well described by Dr. Moore, which is that early mortality in trauma-induced coagulopathy is driven by hypocoagulability. But that really what becomes a complicated problem is what drives this late mortality, which is all driven by hypercoagulability and fibrinolytic shutdown. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, we actually haven't looked, and maybe Dr. Moore, this is our next project, but we haven't looked at the differences in thrombotic morbidity and related mortality in trauma patients in the later window. I would suspect it would be higher in females. Another question I have, I have a suggestion. Um, in in vitro uh, fertilization, women are subjected to very high estrogen levels. Uh, prior to implantation, uh, and they have enormous amounts of trauma generation as measured by trauma generation activities. You might want to take a look at that literature and see how it melds into yours, because they are in vivo experiments dealing with the whole estrogen progestin issue. So, also, what do you use? Acknowledged and agree. Thank you. Why didn't you use thrombin as an activator? So we, we have actually now, as you may know, through our ongoing tactic work, there's several other um, agonists that we're looking at. We're looking now at thrombin and at collagen um, with an interest in sort of the different receptors that those are playing on. So we are looking at that, but the story is TBD. You'll probably hear about it at tactic in the spring. Okay. <laughs> We don't seem to have any questions from the audience. Is that correct? Uh, I think we have two. Um, so the first is, is the sex dimorphism of platelet response, were you able to show any differences in postmenopausal females? And what about in premenarchal females? Sure, like so I'm happy to elaborate. One. Okay. I'm happy to elaborate a little bit on that. And I sort of gave a sneak preview of this answer just a minute ago with Dr. Mann. But interestingly, we found that compared to the pre and postmenopausal women, the postmenopausal women had platelets that were the most hyperactive, um, which is not what we thought, because we thought this was sort of all at first we were thinking of this hypothesis of that circulating sex hormones were the story. Uh, but I think it's more complicated than that, because clearly, and a postmenopausal woman whose estradiol levels are lower, you would think that their platelets would not be as hyperactive as the premenopausal women. Uh, but that wasn't the case. And so we think that part of that is just because of this lifetime exposure of sex hormones that somehow that affects the mega karyocyte lineage. Um, and so then I think, you know, the two next logical questions are, did you measure estradiol, estrogen levels in these females? We did. It's lower in the postmenopausal women. And then the next question is, okay, well, if we think it's because of the megakaryocyte lineage being different, let's look at that. And I, we would love to do that. Turns out uh, getting bone marrow samples and megakaryocytes from patients is a very tricky thing to do. And so we have not quite made that study happen yet, but that would be the ideal is to see, you know, is there a difference in the biology of the megakaryocytes of females versus premenopausal versus postmenopausal females. To me, that would be a fascinating chapter of this story, and we'll see if we can get there. There's a question from the audience. How about in war? Do, does uh, these data give you any information as to whether injured males versus females would be should be approached differently? And was the beginning of the, qu page, the question in war, meaning in a combat yeah, setting? Military trauma, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great uh, question. I would assume that this, the combat injury complex and shock would have the same divergence of sex dimorphisms and coagulation and clinical outcomes. We have now just looked at it in civilian patients, but, you know, I do think that the implications of this research may have even more translation to a combat setting than a civilian setting, because sort of my dream of dreams and the things I've talked to Dr. Urshad Chowdhury about, if any of you know this body of work, he's contributed much to the background for this, which is, you know, 
that we give someone estradiol who's in co profound coagulopathy as part of their resuscitation to really provoke a platelet hyper uh, hyperactivity and a hypercoagulability that could be life-saving in a coagulopathic setting. And, you know, certainly in a combat setting, if all it takes is carrying around a small vial of estradiol and using that in an austere setting where you don't have a lot of resources and don't have as many blood products, I think the implications of this work are, are perhaps more significant even in the setting of, of combat-related resuscitation. Dr. Moore, did you want to make any comments? As usual, I have little to add to what uh, Julia presents, uh, but I did want to bring up the issue, as you're uh, well aware, that uh, platelet activation uh, increases with age. So we have another variable as we begin to look at pre versus post menopausal, but certainly in men that, and Julia has done some of this research, uh, certainly older men have more hyperactive platelets. Do we have any other questions from the audience? It looks as though we've had a couple more come in. Um, I'll read the next one. Have you studied platelet products used for transfusion to see if it mirrors your findings in samples drawn directly from women? So the platelets that we studied are actually platelets from our blood bank. Um, so these are the same products that we're using to transfuse in our patients, which is one thing that was exciting to us about the platelets that we were studying because they're the exact ones that we're giving our patients. And I, I think, again, sort of calling a question whether when you're hanging back of platelets, you should be thinking about, is this a female or male donor? And is it going to make a difference? Um, so that's one, you know, and then I think uh, the next question, which is another, I'm giving away some of our, our, our future presentations here, but another sneak preview of right now work that we're doing is sort of doing in vitro transfusions and taking platelets from females and putting it into blood from males and measuring the response to MA and vice versa. So looking at sex concordant and discordant transfusions in vitro and seeing if it causes a difference in MA because I would expect and this work would suggest that if you took, if Dr. Mann presented in trauma-induced coagulopathy and you gave him my platelets, that it would improve his MA more than if you gave him Dr. Moore's platelets. And so that that's sort of the next question that we have and that we're looking at uh, in our next round of experiments right now. Another question from the audience uh, referring to uh, previous webinars from FWGDB. <clears throat> and so it wants to know if the, uh, is, is the effect of estrogen receptor mediated so immediate effects are unlikely to incur? So, so how does this impact uh, your thinking? They talk about the, the, the time function um, output of estrogen treatment of, of platelets. How, how, does this, how does this change with time? How does the effect of, I just wanna make sure I understand the question correctly. How does the effect of estradiol um, change over time in a platelet? Time of treatment. The time of treatment. Oh, like the amount, the time that we incubated it for? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. Um, we decided with 15 minutes um, because other um, add back experiments, that's the amount of incubation time that we've done. But to be forthright, there was not a lot of science behind that decision. Um, that's what we had used for other add back experiments. And so that's what we decided. Um, I do think that it is amazing that we already saw changes just with 15 minutes of incubation. So I think whatever's happening is happening very quickly. Um, but the 15 minute incubation time was a little arbitrary. Okay. Are there other questions, uh, Kimberly? Uh, we have a couple comments. Great presentation. Um, yeah, I think people are really enjoying it. So, um, are there any other uh, any other questions? Please submit them in your uh, in the question panel. But in the meantime, are there any other comments that you would like to share? Just about you know um, from Dr. Moore or from Dr. Mann about Dr. Coleman's presentation, or um, anything else that you'd like to pass on to our attendees? Well, I would like to uh, 
commend Dr. Mann for putting together uh, this organization called Tactic, which is really, uh, and I supported collaboration between uh, basic scientists and physician scientists, and we have learned a lot from this. I think ultimately, as uh, suggested here, our ultimate goal is precision medicine for the patient. And a lot of that depends on the timing uh, suggested by Dr. Mann. And I think the, our challenge in dealing with coagulopathy is trying to uh, maintain homeostasis. And if we get overzealous with products early, we may pay for it later with thrombotic uh, complications. And those are both micro and macro, micro being in a sense of organ dysfunction later. So I think this is, uh, you know, one important step that all this work Julia has done to uh, to our ultimate goal of really precision medicine for uh, hemostasis. Well, I would concur with that goal because obviously no one on this in this on these images looked like anybody else, and that's on the external. So you really can't conclude that your blood basically is not individually managed as well. So we need to have rapid assessment technologies that are definitive with respect to predicting pathology. And that TEG, TEG, TEG is certainly going a long way to doing that, but I think there are other possibilities on the horizon uh, for point of care management measurement of what's going on in blood. Kimberly, did you want to go on to the question uh, answer? Yes, that would be great. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Rachel, would you be able to um, put the poll questions back up? Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, we can circle back if anyone does have any last remaining questions. But in the meantime, uh, we would like to request that you take the post test questions now. So, with that, mm -hmm. Again, this, the same two questions. The following characteristics on thromboelastography are associated with females. First, prolonged time to clot formation. Second, increased rot, uh, rate of clot propagation and clot strength. Thirdly, uh, hyperfibrinolysis. Uh, fourth, longer time to reach maximal clot strength. So go ahead and if you could um, record your responses now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. If you could send that in the chat panel, I'm sorry. I think we um, had, a, had a technical issue with that one, so I apologize. If you would like to type your response in the chat panel, we can compile that um, uh, via hand later. So, thank you all. Terrific. Okay, we'll just wait another minute or two before folks can record that. And then moving on to the second poll question. The mechanisms underlying female-specific hypercoagulability, which confers, confers a survival benefit after injury, include, again, those same great responses, prolonged time to clot formation, increased rate of clot propagation and clot strength, hyperfibrinolysis, or longer time to reach maximal clot strength. So wait just another minute. Okay. And as you finish, we will have a couple more minutes. If you do have any remaining questions, we can certainly take one or two more. Okay, thank you all so much for um, your responses. This is terrific. Based on the responses, I must not have put everyone to sleep. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sharp crowd for sure. <laughs> well done, everyone. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, and then I'll just uh, go through a few last remaining um, housekeeping notes. Again, um, we will be offering CME credit today. Uh, so I will be emailing you all with that information. 
But I'd like to first thank Dr. Coleman, Dr. Moore, and Dr. Mann for this incredibly informative presentation. We are pleased to provide this program at no cost to attendees. You will receive an evaluation immediately following the program. Please do complete that, and we'll also send information regarding the CME credits. Do know that we take your evaluation responses very seriously and use those as the basis for much of our program. And we are um, reviewing all of that right now uh, to look at our 22, 2022 program. So please um, complete those evaluations. Uh, next slide, Rachel. Perfect. And we'd like to um, uh, say save the date. We have our biannual conference coming up, our first in-person conference coming up on September 24th and 25th, 2022 in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. And we do hope that you all will be able to attend. We're expecting a really good group. Uh, we will make this a very collegial and informative conference and um, a lot of very good networking. So we encourage you all to attend. But again, we'd like to thank our three wonderful presenters today um, for their depth of knowledge, their expertise, and it was such a terrific presentation. So thank you all so much. And thank all of you for your attendance today, and we look forward to your future participation in foundation programs. Thank you again. Have a great on day. Behalf, okay. On behalf of the society, I'd like to thank the attendees for their participation. I'd like to thank Dr. Coleman and Dr. Moore for the presentation and commentary. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, Kimberly, for your organizational efforts. Thank you very much.